International Director of CAGE, was stopped by police under Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act as he returned mm. to the UK from Qatar, where he had visited an alleged torture victim of US security agencies. Although not suspected of any crime, the police demanded that he hand over his mobile and laptop passwords. He was arrested for willfully obstructing police when he refused to hand them over, citing that he had confidential documents related to torture victims. Last week, he was found guilty and ordered to pay a fine. We are joined this evening by Muadham Beg, Director of Outreach at CAGE, to discuss the case. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Welcome everyone, my name is Bilal Abdul Karim and this is Face the Truth. We have a very special guest here with us this evening and we are going to be trying to unpack these very, very important events. And his name is Muadhim Beg, and he is the Outreach Director of CAGE. And I want to say to him, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you for having me here, inshallah. And it's good to have you here as well. Look, we've got a short time, a lot of ground to cover. And, uh, okay, is everything okay? Okay? Yeah. Um, and uh, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. The first issue that I'm sure a lot of people are going to be wondering, who don't really have the full understanding of these affairs, why wouldn't Muhammad Rabbani at the airport simply give the password, which would save him a lot of problems, a lot of headaches, and he had nothing to hide, why wouldn't he just do that? Uh, well, of course, just for background, uh, Muhammad Rabbani is the international director for CAGE. Um, he was uh, returning last year in last November uh, on a trip from uh, one of the Emirates, from one of these, uh, the Gulf countries, and um, he there had taken testimony from an individual who'd given this testimony on, on based on trust about uh, severe torture that he'd endured at the hands of the United States of America. And uh, it was harrowing enough for Rabbani to listen to this information, to take it down over for days, record it, put it into his, his electronic devices, and then of course uh, uh, plan to seek justice as Cage has been doing for torture survivors for many years uh, when he returns with that information. When he was coming back through the airport in Heathrow, he was stopped by officers again uh, he was under no suspicion. There was no no suggestion that he'd committed any anything wrong at all. Uh, they stopped him for whatever reason, maybe on a hunch, maybe because his name was flagged up. Um, and then they took him for interrogation and asked him for the password to his electronic devices. He said, uh, I cannot give you that because I have uh, uh, confidential information between the client and, and, uh, and, and me. <clears throat> and if I was to hand this over, I breached that trust. So I cannot do that. Uh, and they eventually arrested him and then at a later date they charged him and then uh, last week he was prosecuted and convicted essentially um, as a terrorist for refusing to provide a password that was privileged uh, client attorney information. Uh, wait a minute, um, how does that breach into terrorism if he was not suspected of committing uh, any act of terrorism, how is he charged with terrorism? Well, you know, uh, the laws nowadays, you, you don't have to be a terrorist to be called a terrorist. So uh, we, we know for a fact that there are numerous laws that have been passed in the United Kingdom over the past 14 years that has prosecuted poets, prosecuted booksellers, prosecuted people for looking at things on the internet as terrorists. So um, th the fact of the matter is because of the law, which was a 2000 uh, terrorism Act and Schedule 7. He was stopped under Schedule 7 of the 2000 Terrorism Act. Um, they prosecuted him under terrorism because he refused to give that password, even though he wasn't accused of terrorism. So the, the, the lesson this, is, this has for everybody else is uh, if you're a, a, a lawyer, if you're a doctor, if you're a, a human rights worker or anybody who has privileged information, or just a normal person who wants to protect his normal privacy. You may have pictures of your wife without hijab or your family members that you you don't want anybody to see. So you say, I'm going to, I'm not going to allow them to see that, uh, to, to see that, and uh, they will regard you as a terrorist. The test will be when non-Muslims uh, refuse to give their passwords. Has there been any uh, support that's come from outside of the Muslim community for uh, Muhammad Rabbani during this case? Uh, th there's been a lot of support 
to uh, my knowledge, there's been a, a great deal of support from within the community and beyond. Um, people have uh, human rights workers, lawyers, activists, um, and journalists even, uh, were all there uh, and looking at um, what was taking place with great interest, shocked at uh, on occasion about the level of the nature of this prosecution. Uh, I was there during, at the trial and where police officers were actually saying that uh, we understand that there's a, a people who have privileged uh, information have the right to protect that information and the police officers are supposed to show them the code of practice. And in this case, the police officer said, um, I didn't show him the code of practice because I hadn't established whether he was entitled to one, meaning that he can only tell him about his right to privacy once it's been violated. The result of this case, because um, it, the case has been settled, he has been convicted of a, an act of terrorism. What was the final result? Um, essentially, the final result is that, yes, he has received, a, he's been convicted, um, but uh, the, the problem is that because he's been convicted, um, he, he's essentially now going to be regarded as somebody who has violated the law in this regard. Um, what the judge recognized is that this was a key and important case, and she said, uh, that I, I, I'll give you a, a, a conditional discharge, which means he doesn't go to prison, he doesn't face a fine, he had to pay court costs, which were around £600 or so. Um, but she understood that, and she, and she would like to know further where this um, case is going to go, meaning, is this going to be something that is now adjudicated at higher courts, or is it going to be something now that um, is going to be common, common that whoever refuses to to give their passport words at airports will now be deemed a terrorist. If that is the case, British law has become an ass uh, because that's you can't be a terrorist simply because you don't want to give a password to something that isn't terrorism, terrorism related. Appeal? Yeah, the appeal's already happened. But the important part of this is that the moral victory, uh, Rabani won. He came out uh, surrounded by supporters, clapping, uh, well, not clapping, cheering, shouting, uh, um, uh, uh, bringing chocolates and flowers. Mm -hmm. The media storm was uh, was huge outside, and uh, everybody looked at Rabani as a man of principle, a kind of Rosa Parks, if you like, of the Schedule Seven um, uh, 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 law. He describes Schedule Seven, by the way, as something that as a digital strip search that they can literally strip search all of your information without you without them having a, a warrant or any reasonable cause that you may have committed any crime. So, uh, yeah, the appeal is going ahead, but we believe that the victory uh, happens when people recognize that injustices are being carried out against people. And primarily, um, this is targeted against the Muslim community. It will affect others, no doubt, but we are, of course, the guinea pigs. We're the canaries in the mine, as it were. One of them is this. You spent time, extensive time, around Muhammad Rabbani. What kind of person is he? Um, Rabbani, prior to this, was, was, was the CAGE's managing director, um, and uh, he's now the international director. His role has always been behind the scenes. He's a managerial person. He's a very... Um, uh, he's actually, a very... I'm not asking about that. I'm asking about his yeah. personality. What, what is yeah, he sure. so personally I'm to, yeah, like? So I'm trying to explain... The kind, the kind of person he is, is that so he's, he, he, he organizes and looks after a, a tight ship. He's a man of integrity, a man of honesty, a man of, of, of faith, uh, somebody who believes passionately in the work of Cage. I remember when he first joined the organization several years ago, uh, he knew uh, all the details about the, the cases that we've been campaigning for and the individuals uh, and the, uh, uh, the themes of Cage about defending those whose voices have been drowned out. In the war on terror. So Rabani is the kind of uh, person who has, uh, and the, 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 the judge, importantly in the case, she recognized, she said he's a man of integrity, a man of... She said uh, that? She said that. She recognized it. She, uh, she understood. He has no criminal record at all. Um, so he's a person that is known and loved in the community. Lots of people know him. He's involved in, he was lot, involved in a lot of community work prior to this. He was involved in um, helping to, uh, uh, to get people out of gangs, uh, and that sort of stuff and conflict resolution. So he's a to work with a, it's a privilege to work with somebody like Mohammed Rabani because he really brings all the dignity that you would expect of a person um, that's like him 
And what he did at that airport uh, was to protect his, the, the client's uh, information based on the Islamic concept of amana, that mm -hmm. uh, you, a Muslim does not break his trusts and uh, recognizing that it's one of the signs of hypocrisy to break a trust. So it was based upon those principles and they suppose, uh, on the principles that he's espoused uh, before that, that, that uh, he's in this position. And I think everybody that's interviewed him thus far has recognized uh, that he stood for a principle and he was prepared to go to prison for it. One of the interesting things is that, you know, we're, in a, we're living in a time and an age wherein um, morality, uh, principles, uh, being just, holding fast to your word, are not even characteristics that we can realistically say we're looking for in our leaders. I, I think that somewhere, as individuals, we've gone off the track, and our whole set of values in terms of what we look for in leadership has gone in totally different direction, which leads me to my final question. You're talking to an international audience right now. Maybe some of the people have not heard that much about the case, and this might be the first time that they're actually hearing about it. So in final, if you could walk away with one or two lessons from this entire case, what would it be? Uh, in my view, it's the concept of standing firm for a principle. And in this case, it was the principle, three principles. One mm -hmm. principle is of trust, the amana. The second principle is, the tr is, is that of the right to privacy, that nobody invades your privacy uh, without, without reasonable cause. And the third is the right not to be harassed at airports simply because you're a Muslim and to stand up against all of those three, even if it means the threat of imprisonment. After all, famous people like Martin Luther King were imprisoned over 29 times uh, based upon the uh, unjust laws of Jim Crow and so forth. So going to prison for a belief um, is neither something to be ashamed of or something that people should shy away from. If, if prison means standing up against something evil, then we should all be prepared for it. Hey, I want to thank you a lot for helping us to unpack some of this uh, uh, very complex uh, 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 issues surrounding this case. Um, you know, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And inshallah, hopefully we can have you on again, but hopefully under different circumstances. Inshallah. Um, and uh, I, I, again, uh, Jazakumullah khair to you and to all of your team at OGN for bringing this issue to light. Uh, you have much greater things that you have to be concerned about and that you're concerned about the affairs of, of us here shows um, just how connected you are to the rest of the world, uh, despite the fact that you're living under the rain of bombs uh, every day. It's a, it's a great credit to you and your team uh, that you're concerned with the issues of uh, of not just here here in Birmingham, in Britain, in, in London, but even in Burma and uh, and the Rakhine state and so forth. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and continue, allow you to continue to do the work um, to benefit all of mankind. Amin, amin. Okay, uh, everybody, this is Bilal Abdul Kareem. You have been watching Face the Truth. May Allah reward you all. Jazakumallah khaira. Don't be shy to comment below. Let us know what you think. And we will be catching up with you for our next episode, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumallah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.